millions of us love watching the world's wildlife behaving in strange and wonderful ways. But what lies at the heart of these extraordinary behaviors? Can science explain what's really going on? Now the latest research from all around the world is increasing our understanding of animal emotions, relationships, intelligence and communication faster than ever before. We're going to be traveling the world in search of the most surprising and incredible animal stories. Oh, there, 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 there. Wow, yeah, look at them. Using the very latest camera technology, we'll reveal how and why animals do such remarkable things. And we'll meet the scientists that is a little male. who dedicate their lives to understanding these extraordinary discoveries. In this show, we're in the woodlands of northwest Austria, where scientists are interpreting the howl of the wolf and asking if they really deserve their big, bad reputation. We discover the communication skills required to persuade a penguin raised by people to swim. And in Australia, we meet the conservationists using cutting-edge communication technology to try and save an iconic endangered species. But first, we're in Limpopo, South Africa's most northern province. Here, an incredible love story is unfolding between two very different lions. Zukara, who lives here at the Sao Conservancy, and Cleopatra, who used to live on the other side of the fence. Now they're going to meet face to face for the very first time. A week ago, ecologist Jason Turner organized for Cleopatra to be transferred into the reserve after years of extraordinary behavior from the nine-year-old lioness. She was obsessed with wanting to join the pride of lions on, on this side. So, she was at the fence line every day. She swam across a river, climbed under an electric fence in order to bond with our male. The male who had caught Cleopatra's attention wasn't just any lion. It was Zukara, one of just 12 white lions left in the wild. A very rare change in their DNA causes their splendid color. And it sadly meant that white lions have been hunted almost to extinction. For five years, Cleopatra had appeared every day at the fence of Zakara's reserve, obsessively waiting to see him. Lionesses generally mate with a male who's the head of their own pride, normally a big, dark-maned male. Jason, who has worked with lions for 20 years, has never seen a lioness go to such lengths to communicate her feelings for a male who was completely out of her reach. This obsessive behavior, going up and down the fence line, putting on seductive moves like you've never seen, lots of tail swishing, the lionesses will roll over, they've got this white, sort of very sexy belly that they flash at the males. Lionesses are arch seducers. I mean, seduction was invented by lionesses. Today, we're hoping to see some unique lion behavior. Zukara and Cleopatra are going to meet face to face for the very first time. Lion introductions can be extremely unpredictable. So Zakara has been kept away from her in a separate enclosure to allow Cleopatra to get used to her new surroundings and bond with resident lioness Swalu. Now, 
Now the team are opening the gate to release Sukara back into the 4,000 acre reserve. Biologist Patrick Ayi has joined Jason to see if Sukara picks up Cleopatra's scent. We found Sukara. Listen to that. So you can see he hasn't wasted any time. He's doing what we expected him to do, and that's the natural male response. He's picking up the chemical signals, the pheromones, from where Cleopatra scent marked. And uh, that grimace, what he's doing is, it's called Flemin. And he's picking up the scent, so he knows that she's here. He there. knows that she's here. And he's, it looks to me like he's figuring out which way she's gone. Scent markings aren't the only way lions communicate with each other. On the other side of the reserve, the lionesses are on the move. Cleopatra's out in front, picking up Zucara's calls. This communication is a good sign. But this is a love story that could end in tears. Like all lions, Zucara and Cleopatra are powerful creatures. Males in particular can be extremely aggressive to outsiders. So even lion expert Jason doesn't know exactly what's going to happen when Zucara and Cleopatra meet. Lions are very fiery animals. They can be very aggressive. Of course, they're fierce hunters, predators, and the males are incredibly territorial. So bringing two adult lions together, there's always going to be fireworks. Lionesses often have to work together to defend themselves from other lions. And Jason is hoping that resident female Swalu will help Cleopatra if things turn nasty with Zakara. As the sun sets, it looks like Zakara and Cleopatra could meet at night. It's vital the team witness this first encounter, because how they interact will show if they have a future together. So the team are going to try to stick with Zakara throughout the night. Okay. Got full signal on Zakara. A full signal from Zakara's radio collar means he's within 10 meters of the truck. Here he comes, here he comes. It seems he's definitely on the move and on the hunt for Cleopatra. Lions have their own distinctive roars, as unique as our fingertips. And there's no doubt Cleopatra will be hearing these calls. An hour later, Zakara appears by the fence, and he's not alone. Just in front of him are Swalu and Cleopatra. After five years, Zakara and Cleopatra are finally face to face. Swalu hangs back. They're so tentative.
that was so electric. How amazing is that? He came in for them almost, but they both instantly were like, no, don't try and mess with us at all. <laughs> we mean business. Their encounter ends with a final scent spray from Zakara. It's one of many signs that he's receptive to Cleopatra's presence. Never seen anything quite like it. That was really exciting. I was still pretty, pretty shaky. I mean, it happened all within a split of a second, and you've got these two strong, powerful lions, Cleopatra and Zakara, but no one was doing any damage, it seemed. Exactly. Uh, heated engagement, but you could see more bark than bite. No excessive use of violence, really, more just um, demanding respect from each other. Their non-aggressive calls and lack of violence are signs that as first dates go, this has been a roaring success. Zakara made a beeline for Cleopatra, and in a dramatic act of loyalty, Swalu rushed in to back her up. Together, they stood their ground, with Zakara adopting a position behind the bush, which shows his respect for newcomer Cleopatra. These are all positive signs for a future relationship between them. This is exactly what you've been waiting for for five years. I, I'm, I mean, I'm ecstatic. Uh, I mean, bungee jumping's got nothing in terms of the adrenaline that I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling that, it too, that's Those for sounds sure. were just phenomenal. After just a week and no longer separated by a fence, Zakara and Cleopatra are spending most of their time together. Their phenomenal story has given us new insight into the lengths a lioness will go to to communicate with the males she wants. Back in the UK, Birdland in Gloucestershire is home to Britain's only breeding program for endangered king penguins. Here, one man has been on an extraordinary mission to try and teach a penguin how to swim. <laughs> Hello. Zoologist Lucy Cook is joining head keeper Alistair Keane with very special penguin Charlotte. Our 14 month old king penguin. Hello, Charlotte. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Charlotte had an unusual start in life. She was laid as an egg last year by Frank and Lily. Um, and within 24 hours, Frank had dropped and broken the egg. So we had to take the egg away and repair it with a little bit of super glue. Um, wow, you can do it, that? Yeah. You can repair an egg with super glue? Yeah, as long as it's not too big a crack. If penguin parents drop an egg, they tend to abandon it. So Charlotte became Alistair's responsibility. I like to talk to the egg because the parents would call to the chick. Do you talk to it in a human voice or in a penguin? I just talk to it as, as I normally would, like I'm talking to you now. So I sort of keep going, chick, I'll see you soon and things like that. Aww. Sounds really silly, I know. When birds hatch from their egg, they form an immediate bond with the first living creature they see. It's known as imprinting. The first thing Charlotte saw wasn't her mum, it was Alistair. As far as she's concerned, I'm mum and dad. She's got to give me grandchildren, so to speak, in the next few years. By six months, Charlotte was fully grown, with a thick coat of brown downy feathers, perfectly adapted to keep her warm as she developed. <laughs> That's her begging for you, isn't yeah. it? She's going, Dad, feed me, come feed me. Come and give me some more food. And like any typical king penguin chick, at 12 months, Charlotte's coat molted and she started to transform into the stunning adult she is today. All right, Charlotte. So I think you're getting five stars as a penguin parent, from Thank what you. I can see. Yeah, we got so far, so good. And then we hit a snag in the fact that she just would not go in the pool. She's a penguin. I know, that's, but everyone would think they'd take to it really easily, but she was having none of it. She'd watch everyone else go in for a swim. She would not go in. Despite Alistair's best efforts, Charlotte could not be coaxed into the water. 
What was going on? In the wild, it's very important that king penguin chicks avoid water while they're still wearing their brown coat of baby feathers. It's warm, but it's not waterproof. So if it gets wet in the icy waters of the Antarctic, the chicks can drown or die of hypothermia. Only when they get their waterproof adult plumage do they pluck up the courage to take the plunge. What surprised Alistair was that although Charlotte's body was fully equipped to swim, her mind was clearly saying no. Perhaps penguin expert Professor Rory Wilson can shed light on Charlotte's strange behaviour. Rory, are you surprised by Charlotte's fear of water? A bit surprised, but not hugely. Um, it's a big deal if you're a penguin, from being a woolly, fluffy thing that lives on land. And there's this terrible transition period where you have to do it. It's like bungee jumping. So I think there's a lot of fear there. So what do the parents do in, in terms of encouraging them into the water? They're brutal. It's tough love and it's do or die. The king penguin chicks, they actually go through the whole winter starving. They'll get the odd meal from their parents. They'll go down to about seven kilograms, really, really thin and miserable. It's hunger that drives young penguins to overcome their fears and into the sea to catch fish. But Alistair wasn't prepared to take this tough love approach with Charlotte. He'd have to find another way to get her to swim. First thing we try to do is push her in. And she jumped straight back out, had none of that. No matter how hard he tried, it became clear that gentle persuasion wasn't going to work. Alistair had to resort to more dramatic methods. We've got a rock in the middle of the pool. I took her and sat her on the rock, so she had to get wet to get back out. After hours of intense encouragement, Charlotte decided to take control of her fear. It's the only time I've ever seen a king penguin with both feet off the ground. She went in feet first, almost a cannonball. Alistair and Charlotte had cracked it. And once she was in the water, Charlotte's instinct to swim kicked in. Four months later on, thanks to Alistair's coaching, Charlotte loves nothing more than a dip in the pool. She's getting very good now. She's the first one in there most days, last one out. You're a proud dad. Proud dad, yeah. <laughs> In the woodlands of northwest Austria, one animal's spine tingling howl has landed it with a big, bad reputation. Here, groundbreaking research into how wolves communicate is revealing that they might actually be more loyal, tolerant, and friendly than we ever imagined. The Wolf Science Center is home to 12 timber wolves, the largest of all wolves. In the wild, they're specialized pack hunters of bison, moose, and elk. Here, in order to make them tolerant of people, they're hand-reared for the first five months of their lives before becoming part of a pack. This allows the team to study their behavior up close. It's long been thought that the pack is held together by an aggressive alpha male, and the only loyalties the other members have are to him. But when researchers Dr. Simon Townsend and Kurt Conchal removed different members from the group, they began to think that there was more going on within the pack dynamic. We're coming. So today we will remove Aragorn, 
and then we're going to look at the behaviour of all the other wolves remaining in the pack. Whenever they separated a wolf, Oops. in this case second in command Aragorn, the rest of the pack would have an extraordinary reaction. Ah. Scientists believe the wolves are trying to call back their missing pack member. Their howls can be heard more than four miles away, and wolves can recognize the individual calls of their pack. Simon analyzed the howls using what's known as a spectrogram. You can see there's two howls, a shorter one and a longer one, and you can see how the howl changes over time. What this can tell us by taking measurements is we can work out what kind of information is encoded in the howls and also how often specific wolves are howling and how long their howls are. By repeating the test many times, he discovered something surprising. Different wolves would howl longer and louder for certain individuals. It looked as if within the pack, it wasn't all about the alpha male. The wolves each had their own particular best friends. This new study is changing our perception of how the pack works. The scientists here are so convinced that we've misunderstood wolves that Dr. Frederica Ranga has devised another experiment that looks at a different form of wolf communication, their body language. Frederica believes that because wolves have to hunt together to bring down big prey, there are more tolerant species than their closest relatives, domesticated dogs. So we basically put a bowl of food in between two animals and then we see who's eating and who's not. And this is really about testing tolerance, so whether the animals share food with each other or not. First up, it's the dogs. Will Meru share his food with junior pack member Hiari? Open, open! Both dogs rushed for the bowl, but Hiari doesn't get any food. And he seems to know that he shouldn't get any closer to Meru while he eats. The other one doesn't even dare to get close to the food. Not only does Meru refuse to share, but the hierarchy between the two is so ingrained, Hiari knows not even to try to challenge him. OK. Every time we run the test, underdog Hiari is left with nothing. He just gets to lick the empty plate. Man's best friend, not quite as tolerant as we thought. How will the wolves fare? We've got Casper, the alpha male, and junior pack member Shima. If the old assumptions about wolves are true, alpha male Casper will eat all the food and Shima will be left with nothing. Remarkably, the wolves behave in a completely unexpected way. So basically what we see here is that they do share. There's a bit of grumbling in between, but the other one just ignores it. Unlike the dogs, even though Casper is the dominant male, he tolerates sharing with Shima. It's really that they do communicate with each other and even if the lower ranking animals say if they don't like something and they have the right to say it. This ability to share and communicate is further proof that the wolf pack is much friendlier 
and less hierarchical than we previously thought. Scientists believe that as dogs became domesticated, they learned to scavenge for food as individuals. But wolves have always had to hunt together to bring down big prey. They've had to be tolerant, communicative, and friendly to survive. thousand miles away on the other side of the planet, in the eucalyptus forests of Queensland, Australia, conservationists are harnessing the power of communications technology originally designed for the military. They're trying to save an iconic species that us humans are putting under huge pressure, the koala. Deforestation isn't just wiping out animals in remote places like the Amazon. It's also happening in towns and cities, like this one, Brisbane. Conservationist Giles Clark is meeting a recent victim of the rapid urban expansion here in Queensland, where the koala population has plummeted by 40%. You can really feel how sharp those claws are. <laughs> Koalas like Rocket are coming under threat as new roads and most recently a railway line are slicing through the ancient eucalyptus forests they live in. Now a team of conservationists is coming to the rescue of the small koala population that's still clinging on. They have fitted over 200 koalas with sophisticated satellite trackers. It's a pioneering new technique which is having a remarkable impact. This technology allows the team, led by Tosh Tucker, to pinpoint the location of every koala and easily find and capture individuals to monitor their health in a way they never could before. We're gonna go look for Gonzo today. He's, uh, Gonzo. <laughs> yeah, he's one of our little boys in this site. So what am I do? Here's our site here. Wow, and each one of those little blue dots is a koala. Mm, that's right. That is truly incredible. And is it real time? There's a slight lag, but there's every four hours we get a, a transmission. It only takes a few seconds to find Gonzo's name on the map, and he looks dangerously close to the road. So that little spot so there, this is him then, by the looks of it? That's Gonzo, yep. Yeah. And hence this big highway is what we can hear over the back. Exactly, yeah. Once we get an idea of where he is, I'll put his frequency in and we can pinpoint exactly where he is and makes it a lot easier to find. Using a handheld receiver, the team are able to pick up Gonzo's frequency almost immediately and they set off to find him. Sounds like he's just in this patch here. Start looking up? Yep. Ah, there he is, mate. Just look in, the, in that vine near the acacia. And he's just sitting in, oh, that, yeah, I got him. in, that, in that fork there. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. With Gonzo located, Tosh calls in his team. The plan is to get Gonzo down to check his radio collar and to give him a thorough health check. All right, B, I'm just going to get down to that lateral. In close knit koala communities, diseases can quickly spread and wipe out entire groups. Nice and easy. It's vital the team can make sure every koala is in the best health possible if this population is to survive. Grab him, man. All right, Giles. Come in there, mate. Just put him under the bottom there. Hello, little fella. A handful of fresh leaves and Gonzo's ready for his checkup which each koala gets twice a year. He's loving it. Yeah, it'll calm him right down. He's happy as Larry. Veterinarian Dr. John Hanger has been treating koalas for over 20 years. Back at his surgery, Gonzo is sedated. Let's give him a once over, hey? First, John checks Gonzo's heart. 
Sounds good. Next, he checks Gonzo's sharp teeth are all present and correct. Then on to his all-important tracker collar. So we just make sure there's plenty of growing space in there because the youngsters are growing rapidly, so we need to make sure that this doesn't get too tight. Then he takes a look at his feet. They're great big blistered. Yeah. That's not normal. No, OK. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get a photo of that. Gonzo's blistered foot is nothing serious, but even so, John will keep a record of it. Finally, he uses an ultrasound to scan Gonzo's kidneys, stomach and bowel to check he is processing all that eucalyptus properly. So there's the bladder there, the black structure there. Okay, you can see the fermenting parts of the bowel. Eucalyptus is poisonous to many animals and impossible for them to digest. But koalas have a special bacteria in their stomach that can break it down. This movement is a sign that all is well with Gonzo. They really are just leaf processing machines, really. They certainly are. <laughs> He's really starting to wake up. I think we should think about getting him back into that forest. Okay. Gonzo's been given a clean bill of health. But John isn't going to return him to just any old tree. Until they are two years old, koalas like Gonzo prefer to be close to their mums. And using the satellite technology again, John can track down Gonzo's mum. We'll just scan down here to find her name. So these are all the koalas with those special collars on. Her name is Jador, and with a click of his mouse, he has found her. OK, so she's hanging around here at the moment. This tells us that the last upload from her collar was five hours ago. So with a bit of luck, she'll still be at that point, or if she's not there, hopefully she'll be fairly close, but we'll be tracking her with the conventional telemetry gear as well to make sure that... To really hone in on the spot. That's right. This technology, it's incredible, the access that it's given you and the information. Yeah, it's, it's allowing us to monitor the koalas far more uh, intensively than we could have otherwise, and that means that we can intervene much more quickly if they get into trouble. Gonzo has just recovered from his anaesthetic, and the team are off to track down his mum and set him free. Sort of getting this, the strongest signal from... Around this area sort of area. Is that her? A koala in a tree? Well done, Giles. Yeah, I think that is, is her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right up yeah. here. Gonzo's mum is spotted, and he's released back to a tree nearby. Gonzo steps out tentatively at first, but he is soon back in the swing of things. Off he goes. He's not hanging around. So far, with the help of this communication technology, the team have helped protect over 400 koalas. The hope is that this technique could one day be rolled out across Australia to help protect the 100,000 koalas who live in the wild. In British Columbia on the west coast of Canada, this footage caught on camera phone shows a family of killer whales, or orcas. They are one of the ocean's smartest mammals, and this group is behaving in a truly bizarre way. Holy moly. Oh my god. This is crazy. Could these highly unusual orca antics give us new insight into the sophisticated ways that these amazing marine mammals socialize and communicate? This group had come right into the shoreline and appeared to be rubbing their bellies on the pebbles. Marine biologist Jackie Hildering has observed this behavior firsthand. The first time I ever witnessed the behavior it was actually only hearing it and not seeing it. I had an underwater microphone so I could hear the whales communicating back and forth. But also I could hear the rocks then over one another as you had these long skids uh, across uh, the smooth rocks. Jackie's convinced that the orcas were deliberately rubbing their bodies along the pebbles. They'll get down low, 
and scratch every part of their body, skidding across smooth rocks. At first, scientists thought that this was an extreme orca exfoliation, that the killer whales were trying to remove parasites from their skin. But if this was a purely practical habit, you'd expect it would be something all the orcas in these waters would do. In fact, researchers know it's only a few groups of orcas who behave in this way. Why on earth would it be that one population would be rubbing off parasites, have parasites, when the others wouldn't? Oh, oh my God. A breakthrough came from listening to the clicks and squeaks from the orcas, which accompanied this belly rubbing behavior. The sheer intensity of their communication suggested a surprising interpretation. The sounds being made, it is quite something. It's the same sorts of excited calls that they make when family groups meet up with one another. So this had to be social behavior. And it probably feels darn good. My belief is it's a whale massage. It seems that taking time out for a feel-good pebble massage is fun for this family. And what's even more extraordinary is that while we've known for some time that orcas communicate survival skills like how to hunt to their offspring, we now have evidence that just like us, they can communicate their social traditions to the next generation. It's absolutely the case that this behavior is passed on from generation to generation. One of the young killer whales in the footage now has her own calves and is teaching them to be shrimp. Oh my God, oh baby, baby. In the much warmer waters of the Atlantic Ocean that surrounds the islands of the Bahamas, new research is giving us fresh insight into another of the ocean's predators, the shark. Zoologist Lucy Cook and Dr. Tristan Guttridge are off the coast of Bimini, heading to a lagoon hidden in the mangrove forests. really hidden away. To get there, they have to make their way down a narrow corridor in the mangroves. But researchers recently discovered that young sharks were able to use this lagoon as a safe haven to rest and feed in as they grew up. The roots make it too small for large sharks to fit through. So, this is it. Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Gosh, you'd never know it was here, would you? This unique research site is showing that instead of being the lone, mindless, mechanistic killers most people think of, sharks could be social, make friendships, and even have personalities. It's not long before the first inquisitive shark comes to investigate. Go. Nice, beautiful one coming. Really healthy looking sharks in here as well. The sharks here are juvenile lemon sharks, short nosed and stocky. Adults can grow up to three meters long and have powerful jaws. At the moment, they're just patrolling around, they're very calm. They look kind of cautious, actually. To be, to be honest, they look more nervous of me than I am of them. Yeah, absolutely. It was long assumed that sharks, who are generally loners, would only communicate with each other to fight over food or mate. But their behavior here is suggesting that's not the case. What we found over the years is that they actually follow each other. They, they socialize in this area. So they're not just kind of randomly swimming around solitary. They actually are following each other in groups and they switch groups and change groups over time. And they seem to have actual kind of friends, really, that they prefer to associate with. Wow. 
But when researchers put food into the water to observe what happened when sharks fed, there were further surprising insights into their behavior. What you'll see is that some will come in sooner than others. And I don't think it's purely because one is hungrier than another one. It's actually one of them will probably take a greater risk than the other one. So you can do that and then wiggle it. Ooh, that's it. Here's one coming in now. Oh, look, they're coming in. <laughs> that's it. And then let them go. This is quite a big one. Pretty soon, they are surrounded by over a dozen sharks. Oh, there's a lot of them around me now. Wait. Woo. Now they're really getting excited. There you go. They do all seem to behave in different ways towards the food. Some really play the tough guy. Oh boy, <laughs> just calm down. Others are a little more shy. You've got him. Hello. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> see him shake his head. Yeah. You can see some of them are less inquisitive than others. Some of them come steaming in. Mm. And it, I think it's the same with lots of animals, that they have these different personalities. Ooh. Fantastic. Tristan has been putting his observation that sharks might have different personalities to the test. Personality used to be seen as a highly developed trait only found in dogs and primates. OK, if you want to hop over here, oh, yeah. so I okay. don't want to... So, how will the sharks Hello? fare? Yeah. Lovely. To start, they need to transfer the first subject into the test pen. Here you go. Here you go. This test is designed to see if the sharks have different personalities by seeing how they react when an unfamiliar object, a stripy pole, is lowered into the pen. Let the test begin. The first shark almost immediately goes to investigate the new object. And uh, check it out. It's like that was boldness. It certainly that wasn't scared of it. Wasn't scared yeah. of it. I thought it went in and it came in and it yeah. went and checked it out. Before we lowered that, it was circling round the edge. And now it's completely changed its behaviour and it's just doing sort of pass-bys, isn't it? It's totally checking it out. Mm -hmm. It's a bold shark. It's a bold shark. It's time to test the next shark. Will it behave differently? and show it has a different personality? I reckon this one's going to be timid. Timid? Yeah. I'm going bold. You're going bold on this yeah. one. Yeah, I am going bold. The second candidate seems determined to avoid the stripy pole altogether. It's hugging the edge. Yeah, nowhere near as much interest. But you can see the difference between the two. That's the cool thing to pick out. Tristan and his team have repeatedly tested over 300 sharks. Each one consistently showed its own unique response to the object. And this suggests, for the first time, that sharks really do have personalities. So this isn't just a freak that it's bold today, but it could be timid tomorrow, that you believe that these are fixed personality types? Absolutely. So if we test this shark next week, it should do the same behaviour, or very similar. Cool. We're only just beginning to understand the complexities of shark communication and interaction, but the team believe that having different personality types actually helps sharks as a species to thrive. They can exploit all the food sources available to them, with some who pick off the easy targets and high rollers who take on the big prey. For sharks, it seems success isn't all about physical perfection. Personality plays a role too.
In Florida, in the United States, one of the world's cleverest creatures has learned how to get exactly what it wants by communicating with us. In the small town of Lacanto, Chuck and Alberta Holloway have been receiving strange deliveries. We've got a ballpoint pen. This is a bone, a screw. We don't know what this is. <laughs> We've got a piece of bark, coins, and we have this diamond chip bracelet. Chuck had been putting bird food out on their driveway for almost a year when they first noticed an unfamiliar object amongst the empty peanut shells. I came out to put the feed out and approximately right along in here was the toy car. And how'd it get here? Strange, <laughs> that's all I can say. Determined to get to the bottom of the mystery, Chuck set up motion-triggered cameras to monitor the scene, and they soon revealed who was leaving the gifts. It was the local crows. Scientists know that crows are smart birds and have the reasoning and problem-solving abilities of a seven-year-old child. When the bird food ran out, Chuck and Alberta's crows would often drop off a gift. So far, they've left 57 different items. Studies have shown that crows can recognize and remember individual human faces. And Chuck believes that he might even have received gifts fetched specially for him. This piece is oh, yeah. a piece of PVC fitting. And I was working on the sprinklers in the side yard. So I had PVC stuff out there, and all of a sudden it shows up, you know, like... In the feeding tray. Like they were watching, you know, that this is the... Uh, well, you know, he's doing that, so maybe he'd like this. Thanks to the internet, we know this intriguing crow behavior isn't a one-off. People from all around the world have been reporting the same phenomenon. This is my personal favorite. Crow expert Dr. John Withy helps to explain what's going on. And this is when he dropped okay. this thing. Studies have shown that crows also give each other gifts of food and shiny objects. Sometimes it's young crows sharing food with a, a more dominant individual. Sometimes it's between male and females that are paired. But is this more than just a way of saying thank you? From a young age, crows learn that sharing can be rewarding. The expectation is I share food now and I might, you know, receive something from you in the future. Now it seems that crows could actually be capable of entering a kind of trading relationship with humans. We get the gift when the food is empty. I'm looking at it that they're bartering, like, I'll give you this if you give us some more food. But it sounds like this association of if we bring something, then the food comes back. And they're certainly capable of that kind of learning. Whether this is a case of crows seeking friendship with humans, or these super smart birds have learned how to manipulate us into giving them what they want, Science is certainly revealing that they have extraordinary powers of persuasion.